does feel a bit like Groundhog Day. I feel like this is a this is a conversation we seem to have every year. During advertising week, I was talking to a procurement person from one of our clients, and there was uh, a debate, and the topic was uh, procurement. The debate goes on, and she and she, a procurement client, said, "Precisely, <laughs> right? Precisely, it just keeps going on." So. Um, Everybody sitting here could be a little, I'm going to make this a little more interactive than might be the norm. Um, I'd like everybody who uh, believes that in their agency that they have a client who is paying an unacceptably low uh, fee commission, however you cut it, it's money, and it's all about pricing, unacceptably low level, to stand up, please. <laughs> Okay, so, no, stay standing, stay standing, please, stay standing, stay standing. Uh, now I'd like everybody who has resigned a client with fee income of more than a million dollars a year because the fee wasn't high enough to stay standing. Everybody else sit down. I think this is what we're dealing with, okay. You guys can sit down now, because the simple fact of the matter is um, we have to move beyond just talking about this. Uh, we had almost universal agreement with the fact that we all have clients who we think are not paying us as much as we should be paid, and yet probably, I'm guessing, somewhere between 5 and 10% of us have actually resigned a piece of business because we weren't going to get paid for it. Later on in the day, there is apparently a panel on negotiation. Unless you're prepared to resign a piece of business, you may as well not even show up for the panel. Because if we don't, we're just, we're just playing. And those clients know we're just playing. So the first thing I'd say is, I think the title is, get paid what you're worth, right? OK. The first thing I'd say is, um, uh, it's up to us. It's, we can complain as much as we like about procurement people in client organizations, uh, to which I'd say two things. One is uh, some of the most helpful people I've found in client organizations are good procurement people. And, and secondly, they're just doing their jobs. We're letting this happen to ourselves. Uh, the second thing I'd say is, um, over the years, I've read hundreds of stories in trade publications about agencies that have resigned clients over creative differences. I can't remember the last one I read about an agency that resigned a client because they weren't getting paid enough. So my ask, really, is if we're serious and if it comes to it, we've got to figure out what we really are prepared to work for and then if we don't get that, we've got to resign a piece of business and we have to tell the world we've resigned that piece of business. Because unless there is evidence of that kind of behavior, we have no leverage. That's the first point. The second point is, I suspect that part of the reason why we do what we do and carry on perpetuating this is because we don't really know what we're worth. We think we know what we're worth. We talk a lot about what we're worth, but we don't really know what we're worth. We don't know what our work is worth. And until we know what our work is worth, it's really kind of hard um, to take a position because in the front of most of those client negotiators' foreheads is a thought which says, I can get this from somewhere else. And probably, a lot of the time, deep in the back of our brains, we're thinking they can get this from somewhere else. So until, we, until you're in a position to say, you know what, they can't get this from somewhere else, you're not going to be in a position to, to make a decision about whether to resign or not or take on a piece of business or not. And the good news, and it, I genuinely believe it is good news, is that with each passing day, it becomes easier and faster and cheaper to quantify what the impact of every single piece of work that we do is. 
challenge with, client, uh, with, with any client is, of course, you only know that afterwards. Um, so we tend to be setting up compensation agreements without knowing what the result is. Uh, but I think one of the things we should be looking at in the future is how do we, how do we really gear compensation for particular pieces of work to provide exceptional return when the work itself provides an exceptional return. Um, does anybody know what the uh, difference, how much more effective the most effective commercial produced every year is than the least? As a factor, somebody give me a number. <coughs> See, we really don't know what we're worth. Twice as much? Anybody think it's more than that? Ten times. Ten times. It's 40 times. Four zero. <coughs> 40 X. 4,000%. Uh, that's not my data. It's Millwood Brown's data. The best, the best proxy they have for sales effect is the AI. The highest AI every year is around 40, and the lowest is actually zero, but call it one. You get 40 X. The vast majority, the median, and the middle of the curve is around five. So most of the work is, in, is around five. There's one at around 40, and there are a few that at one or zero. Um, I think we have to shift the focus from trying to get the bulk moved up, because if something is average, then frankly, we should get paid averagely for it. But I think what we're missing out on is when something is truly exceptional, and we know it's exceptional because we're able to prove that it's exceptional, we don't get the exceptional return. It's not going to happen all the time on any one client, let alone most of the time across all of our clients. But it could happen often enough, and for the right reasons, to be able to leverage into, in, into better pricing for that piece of work for the agency. So that's, those are my two things. Unless we're prepared to resign a piece of business, we may as well not be here. And secondly, now is the time for us to really start working on proving how each piece of work works and then leveraging that into exceptional returns for exceptional effect. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. This is such a passionate, important subject to me. I decided that I wanted to bring you the Ogilvy playbook. Um, you can choose to use it or not. But this is something that I am trying to drive uh, into the Ogilvy system in North America because, like Andrew, I believe that if we don't take responsibility for this from the top and basically assign the most important business consequences to it, uh, it's only going to get worse. So let me take you through this, and we'll do this in rapid fire. I am a self-confessed gearhead on this subject. I've had 30 years, in mostly in account management, on the front line of these issues. I've dealt with every single aspect of compensation you can think of, from the good old days of commission, that some people hark back to, to now what is an output cost. I've dealt with dozens of consultants. I've worked with the CEO down to the lowest level in procurement to try and get a deal done. I was trained by Michael Hammer, the former guru on re-engineering, because American Express thought Every single person at the agency had to understand as much about re-engineering as they did. And like many of you, I've done this global, local, every business sector, and so on. And the fact is, all that experience really comes down to a central truth. There is a gigantic trust gap. In every conversation I have with clients about comp compensation, you just pull it apart, and it's a lack of trust. And the problem is that when you have a founder who's second home, <laughs> looks like that, right? There is still to this day this view that no matter whether Ogilvy moves to the far west side of New York or to the you know, lowest cost rent anywhere on the planet, we still somehow make too much money, squander the client's money, we don't treat it as seriously as they do. Uh, and, it's, and it's a lingering issue. And it is to this day as much as it's ever been. The counter problem is our employees now think they work in an industry where job security is zero and where they're not getting salary increases the way they think they should, on the timeliness they should, 
And so we have a trust gap with employees because the deals we're cutting with clients are coming right out of their pockets. And so we're, this is a war on both ends, with the clients and with our own people. Now, what's the problem? I think the problem is we are not having the right conversation with the right people about the right outcomes in the right way. We have many talented people who are in the conversation, but they are not all coming together in the right combination talking about the right stuff. And I think part of the fundamental problem, and this is what makes me crazy when I read in Ad Age the debate that goes on about this subject, is that we are not honest with ourselves about what the client is buying. So we would love, we would absolutely love the client to buy ideas. We know that is the currency of our trade. We know that is where our premium is. We know, to Andrew's point, when we have a great idea, magic happens. How many of you are negotiating based on ideas and the quality of ideas? Almost never. Yes, it happens occasionally, but almost never. And the conversation has shifted to we are just like buying flash memory from a manufacturing plant in Malaysia that they can come in, that they can manage, you know, walk through our processes, look at our factories, and diagnose to the granular cost detail how we could be cheaper, faster, and better. It's a little bit, if you read the story of Apple and Tim Cook and the supply chain negotiations, that's what it feels like now, that we're a flash memory provider, not a provider of big ideas that move clients. But what I think clients are really buying is some combination of all this stuff. They never say it this way. No one says, well, let me come in and buy teamwork from you. But the fact is, when we put it all together, we are selling some combination of all this stuff. And we rarely talk about it in its context of how it all comes together. And I think where it does all come together and where the starting point is of the conversation is, what does that all add up to in terms of outcomes? You know, it's easy to see outcomes in reverse. When I think of the value that we have together created for American Express over, the, over 50 plus years, one of the most valuable financial services companies in the world. And you would think when we're talking to them about compensation, we did nothing to get there. Not, <laughs> not because they don't respect us and they don't, they don't believe in us and don't value us. They've, they've been incredibly generous to us for years and years and years. But the fact is, that's not how they talk about compensating us. When they called up in the middle of the recession, financial recession, and said, you've got to take a haircut because we're taking a haircut. When we come back, they didn't say, oh, God, by the way, we're going to put that back, give that back to you, even though that was sort of the promise. IBM, 1994, break it up and sell it for parts. Today, almost the most valuable brand in the world with Coca-Cola. We weren't negotiating the value of our contribution to IBM back in 1994 but we've got a pretty good story today on the kind of value we're creating. Do we have a value-based relationship with, Amer with uh, IBM? Yes and no. We do in terms of relationship. Do we in terms of exactly how the money comes in? Pretty tough. Wyden and Kennedy, were they talking about the outcome of saving a brand that was about to die and what it means in terms of value now? No. So these things are not being discussed up front. So to me, it starts with talking about outcomes. Now, there are three other really important pieces to the puzzle as well. What are we going to do to drive those outcomes? Who's going to do it? And how are we going to get it there? And that ultimately gets to the cost deal or you know, agenda that we create with clients. So desired outcomes. Are we talking about brand building, equity building? Are we talking about sales results? Are we talking about share building? Are we talking about growing reputation? I had VP in yesterday. BP has got a massive mountain to climb in terms of reputation building. We helped build their reputation. Are we talking about that as an outcome when it comes to how we should be paid? Expanding their business globally, positioning them in the market, and so on. What will we do to get there? You know, are we talking about the stuff that, think, that we think is going to drive to those outcomes? And then, who do we need? How many people? How big is the team? With what skills? What experience level do they need? What capabilities? And then this is the tricky bit. This is now seemingly is the most important part of compensation negotiation. What's the structure of the agency? Whose roles uh, are going to be played at the agency versus the client? Who's going to make the decisions? How much rework do we have to do because everyone thinks they're a decision maker? Who controls it, central or local? Are we working in silos or in, across integrated platforms? And so on. And finally, and then this is where it all gets fun, let's pull apart the economics of the business. So my argument is that right now, how you have this conversation matters, and we are having this conversation in piece parts, not 
not collectively. And that's the problem, because if we let the conversation get split apart, we lose. We absolutely lose. So the argument I'm trying to make is how you have the conversation matters. Starts with outcomes. Then it's about what are you going to do to get there. Then it's about who. Then it's about how. And then it's about the cost. And to me, the most productive client agency conversations are happening in sort of that rhythm. And then once you get there, you got to obviously make sure you're building the business with real value. And so you have, you know, if you're in this rhythm, it works. So here's my prescription. If we're not prepared to have top-to-top -to -top alignment around the shared mission and goals of these client relationships, I agree with Andrew. Forget it. We, our, our lot will not improve. It will only get worse. Because if we're not prepared to have that bargain at the top, there's no way we can enforce it down the line. The other thing is, we got to be really clear what our value proposition is. Because if we're not talking in the context of the value we're going to try and create to deliver those outcomes, then we are just a commodity. We don't have on enough clients the shared people and process management mechanisms. Because ultimately, if we don't agree how we make this work jointly, then it's, the value just seeps out of the, out of the partnership. Two-way performance assessment is, right now, I have basically said to a client, if you are not willing to engage us in a two-way dialogue about the quality we're delivering and what it costs and all the rest of it, then it's a non-starter. Now, is it, is it enforced on every one of our clients? Of course not, but it's, it's got to be part of the, the future. And finally, culture fit. John Awad at IBM said the other day, IBM is never going to be the fastest, is never going to be the cheapest, is never going to work with a client in a certain way, but there's something special at IBM that they're happy to you know, make the case for. And we have to do the same. If, it, if you try and chase to be the lowest cost provider and you know you're not, Ogilvy is never going to be the lowest cost provider. We need to get over it. We need to get over it. And, and I think that's where you have to argue from. So it's about the conversation. Thank you. I thought about uh, this group, and I, a couple of things came to mind. One is how important it is that we're doing this as an industry, because I asked you this morning, when was the last time we did this, knowing that I don't think we've ever done this. So I think it's great that we come together as an industry, really, because if you think about it, we've done this to ourselves. And the, what we've done to ourselves has kind of gotten ourselves to this point where we really do have a problem in being paid for what we're worth. And I think it's a time obviously not to collaborate, which will make the lawyers happy on prices. That's clearly not what we're doing, because there will be many different kinds of models for compensation. But if we did this to ourselves in terms of devaluing what creativity brings to the world's great brands, then I think we can find our way out of this uh, collectively. And there's never been a better time than doing it than right now, because I think there's never been a higher value placed on creativity than today in our business. And if you think about it, We've gone through a great cycle because we've gone through the cycles of the media companies and the digital companies and everything kind of going off and then things beginning to come back together now. And I don't know how many of your clients are saying it, but a lot of ours are wanting more and more things centered around the creative agencies. And I think we can use that as leverage because if you understand that there's never been a higher value placed on creativity than right now. And we've got clients that talk about uh, creativity as the heartbeat of what's current and what's coming. And some of the clients that tell us those sort of things pay us appropriately that way. We've got other clients that talk about creativity not being an indulgence, but being a competitive advantage. And those kind of clients tend to pay us the right way. We have other clients, though, that don't. And I couldn't agree with Andrew more. We need to get, as an industry, some courage back and start resigning businesses that aren't paying us right. And it's hard to do. We can stand up here and talk about it all you want, but that's a very tough thing to do. Because when you do that, you know about the number of people you're impacting in your agency. You understand that there could be jobs lost in it. You got to start down that path, though, and do it. Because when you do do that, and those of us that have done that know what happens internally. And what happens internally is that the respect for the kind of company you are internally goes up. People are proud to work for the company that stands up to a client and says, for creative reasons or for compensation reasons, we're not going to do this anymore because our people are worth more. And that brings up the whole morale of the agency. If we could do that as an industry, 
and really take a more aggressive stance with our clients, I think that would benefit us all tremendously. So my message really is about this meeting, we have all different ways to get compensated by our clients, but most importantly, let's work together as an industry to raise the bar, to put it back where it belongs and keep pushing it higher. There's never been a higher value placed on creativity today, and I believe there'll never be a better time than today to start getting respectfully aggressive with some of our clients. And as you said, Andrew, let's be pu more public about it. You know, it's one thing to resign for creative differences. That can be any number of things. You all know that. But we need to talk more about clients that just are bad clients or bad paying clients and get that out in the press a little bit too. And I think that will begin to lift the bar for us as an industry. So that's what I encourage you all to do. Thank you. I'm the world's least likely person to be here. I haven't been able to talk about money in my agency for 12 years because I always used to just say, look, I just want to do the work. We'll do it for nothing. And they said, you can't talk about money anymore. <laughs> this is a, that's a true story. So I, I'm, I'm not, I wore a shirt that's the closest thing I have to a financial shirt, but that's, that's really, really the best I can do it. This is, yeah, I can just click it here. This is a presentation I was going to do. That's Adam Smith. It's about, um, it's about, it's about free markets. It's just a bunch of glib bullshit, so I'm going to skip it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll do a YouTube thing. I, I actually tried to get out of this, and, and I talked to Tom, and I said, look, I don't really know a lot about this stuff, and I'm not the right person to talk about it. Candace Kirsch, who is our attorney and probably works with a lot of you people, you know, we have an issue now, which is the whole patent liability issue with Interactive. It's a very, very, very big deal. She's a super expert on it. She did the white paper for the, for the four A's. So I said, have, I'm going to give Candace my time, and she can talk about that because she actually knows something. And so Tom said, we'll have Candace and you. So, so we both got screwed in the deal. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Tom said to me that he wanted us to talk because apparently, apparently for some reason, we're known as an agency that tends to hold the line um, on, on financial things. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. If it is true, it's not, it's not because of a solidarity thing with the industry, although we do feel solidarity for the industry. It's simply because um, we don't really want to work with clients who devalue the talent that we bring. Um, I don't think it's good for us. Uh, if cost is the key for a client, it's not going to be a good relationship for us. I don't think it's a good relationship for any agency. Um, I still have the quaint belief that brand stories are driven by talent um, and, that, and that clients who, who seek the, the lowest cost talent in the long run are not going to be very successful. And I think that that I don't know how long that's going to take, but that's, I, I don't know if I'll still be alive, but I think what will happen is, is that there's going to be a natural selection and clients who continue to choose the cheapest way are not going to be very successful. And I think that that's really going to be the end game here. Um, there is a free market, obviously, and clients can, can go buy whatever they want to buy, just like we can go buy whatever, whatever we want to buy from anyone. But, I think that there are certain kinds of clients who are going to continue to value the talent, and everybody else has said this, that, that we can bring to them. All of us have either read or seen Moneyball, and it's charming and it's delightful and there's a lot of truth in it, um, but the reality is the A's never won the World Series, um, and we want clients who want to win the World Series. So that's my message. Thanks. I think the first thing is not to, not to regard procurement as the enemy. They're doing their job. We're our own enemy. Um, uh, what they said is true. It is more important than it's ever been. What they then went on to do is their job, which is to try and find a way to reduce the cost of their company of getting the services that they need. We have to change the currency of that debate away from the inputs to the outcomes. And we have to recognize that there isn't going to be a single simple formula for that, but probably that, we, that we're going to want to be disproportionately rewarded for work that is disproportionately effective. And by disproportionately, I don't mean an incentive of 10% or 15% and averagely rewarded for work that is averagely effective. And, and uh, the, the challenge that we all have is we try to 
we try to settle it all up front rather than, rather than, rather than build a system that's going to make that possible. Because if we were able to do that, um, I think, the procurement people would have done their job and we will have done ours. Obviously, price is an important component. And I guess what I would say is we're not, uh, we don't preoccupy ourselves with what the other, what the competitor might be doing. Because, you know, we're all, those of us that are publicly held companies anyway, we're all under a lot of pressure to perform and to margin and everything else. So you've know, you got to be really careful about the kind of compensation deals you make. If we begin to feel that we're in a competition with an agency that is known for slashing and burning or, or it's a desperate situation for whatever reason, we tend to back away from those. Because at the end of the day, it's not a healthy relationship that we, can, we think that we can successfully participate in. So we just kind of walk away from it. But in general, we focus on what we do, what we believe the value of our creativity is to the client's brand, and how, how it will help them connect with people with the great technology things we have today to connect individually with people and focus on that, what we can deliver, and we don't preoccupy ourselves with what other people might be doing. We each have to draw our own line, and most of us don't draw the line most of the time. Until you've drawn it, you can't possibly hold it. Uh, we think we've got one until we're in the conversation and then we're, and we find out that, oh, that, that that line wasn't there after all. Um, uh, and, I, and I think we've got to you know, look at ourselves and, and figure out where our lines are because we, we just don't do that. We don't do that. And then what happens is you get into a pitch process and you're in it for three months and you've invested millions of dollars of, of time for you know, really talented, hardworking people who've given up their weekends and done all sorts of things in pursuit of this. And then it's just like well, there's one last hurdle and, sort of, and our line moves. We've got to get serious about it. If, if we are serious about it, maybe we're not. Maybe we just like to come here for some kind of therapy and a couple of donuts. But, uh, but you know, if, if we're serious about it, we've got to draw the lines. My sense on these big, complicated negotiations and new business is that we have to, and in some cases it's increasingly happening, we have to start the conversation about conversation, a compensation on a completely separate track at the beginning of the process so that we are not sitting there at five minutes to midnight um, and the client's got the press release hold, held over your head. Uh, because to me, that's where it is very risky to make decisions that are not in the, in the best interest of the, of, the, of the company. I think that is the new reality of the system. Um, I mean, I, I mean let, let's, you know, we're smoking dope if we think that as an operating company, as part of a holding company that is trying to meet revenue targets overall and is looking at their portfolio and trying to figure out where the pluses are and where the minuses are, the idea that you, know, you are not going to be under enormous pressure to rationalize some kind of a, uh, uh, you know, a cost point of view to that potential incremental, I think those, that is not going away. And, I, and so I do think ultimately it goes back to you have to make the best possible choices uh, at every point in this process, because the overall system pressures I don't think are changing anytime soon. Almost all of our compensation agreements are to some degree performance based, right. and after a while, you know, everything gravitates toward the mean, and after a while you get to be so that you can predict it, and sometimes you're wrong, and you know, we tend to predict conservatively, but I think that you, you know, I, I think you can predict that with some degree of accuracy. I think that we've been able to. I think if you do it for a while, you get to a sense of here's what's going to happen. I think. I think you have. That's what you have to do. You got to. You got to plan. You got to plan for the average, but make sure you've built in the upside for the exceptional. But but. And then once you do that, if you have a big enough portfolio of pieces of business, and work that is running on that business that is going to. You know that you're going to have three pieces of exceptional work every quarter. Then over time, you get to the point where you can actually manage it. Um, I don't think, I, I honestly don't think that uh, that whether you have to deliver quarter by quarter or year by year really affects this. I mean, I I honestly think we use that as a as an excuse. Good businesses, good businesses perform well quarter by quarter. They do. Um, I think we've got to get over that.